Oscar Bevis, IFL TV, proudly sponsored by Velas here at Matrim headquarters. Joined by Mr. Charlie Sims. How are you, mate? Good. Thanks for coming down. I appreciate it. No, thanks for giving me and IFL some of your time. Um, Connor's always been good with his time, and I see he's doing some Zoom interviews up there. And I don't know, I'll start with it actually, because obviously you've seen Connor grow from being, I'll say Nigel's son, he's still Nigel's son, but into perhaps more of a stardom role now. Um, and this press is quite a lot. It takes its toll on someone as much as he likes talking and he's always very good in interviews. Um, you can kind of see the, the stardom side now with the amount of press, I suppose. Yeah, quite a big transition actually from, from where we started to where we are now, but I've never seen anybody adapt or embrace it as much as Conor has, so true pro. Just in terms of the fight, obviously, what, five days since his win over Chris Algieri, what's the response been like? Because um, I'd say perhaps since Koivala, every fight, there's kind of been a bigger and bigger hype around Connor. But in terms of the response this time, because you've got the show rule knockout and the good boxing performance as well, I can imagine this has been like the best response you've seen. A hundred percent. Like me and my dad were talking about, you know, the fight during fight week and during, you know, during the build up to when he was in the gym and he was training and stuff. And we were talking about what this fight meant. And I think he's kind of been at this level now for, for a little while. We didn't really get to see a lot of it with Vargas and Granados because Vargas fight didn't last very long. And then Granados, he kind of just ran. So he kind of made it difficult to really showcase anything. But we said, you know, if this, if this win comes on points, it's, it's still going to be a good win. If it comes by a knockout, then we're looking at a star. And I think that's what happened Saturday night. The star was born. And I think now we know that he's going he's gonna to go on to achieve big things. So it was an important night, I think. Um, look, Chris Algieri, Chris Algieri might not have been in his prime. He might have been 37 years old. But he's more than experienced enough to know his way around the ring. Um, and he's been in with some great fighters. So that was, that was a big statement for Conor Ben Saturday night. Yeah, I asked Eddie this question and I'll ask you as well. Um, I think now people see Conor as a world-level fighter and you talk about perhaps this win ha having to come by knockout for you to realise that you've got a star on your hands. Was it this fight that made you realise Conor's at this level or can you go back to perhaps maybe the Vargas win or even previous? Or was it this fight that made you go, right, yeah, ability-wise, we've got a world-level fighter in Conor? I think actually, like, when you even hear Conor talk about it, it's not so much the wins, it's the way that he's doing it. And I think nobody knocked Vargas out in the first round. I think he went like six or seven with Ortiz, somebody else who's highly compared to Conor as a prospect. And then, you know, Granados, he's been in a lot of big fights, tough fights, always seems to go the distance, but always seems to have kind of close decisions. And I think because the scorecards were so wide and it was such an easy fight for Conor, no one really gave him the credit. And then you look at like Algieri, who, you know, he's had three losses former world champion, lost to Pacquiao on points, which is hard. Um, you know, Pacquiao's a, a Hall of Famer or future Hall of Famer. Khan on points. And he lost to Errol Spence via stoppage, but that was via stoppage on the ropes after six or seven rounds. So to knock him out cold in four rounds was a huge statement. And, you know, all of those wins are great, but it was, it's just the way that he's been doing it that I think people are starting to stand up and realise how good he is. Obviously, you were the seconds in the corner that night. Um, we know Connor; he's very intense. He always says he's very intense as well. But Tony's the most relaxed guy I've ever been around. Like he's the most chilled out geezer in the world. So I just want to know from a corner perspective. Obviously, now with the zone, we kind of get a lot more of listening into the corners and actually don't have any adverts, so we we get a little insight. But in terms of Connor coming back uh, to the corner and then Tony, who's like a polar opposite um, sort of personality-wise, I just want to know how that corner sort of runs. The corner's really interesting because obviously my dad's so experienced and um, I'm really not that experienced in the corner. But I actually get really nervous doing the corners and I think I said to him, I think I've said to him the last two fights, I don't actually want to do the corners anymore. I think I'd rather just prefer to sit in the front row and watch the fight. Is that based off notes? That yeah, basically. I think it's just, I get so nervous that I'm just, you know, I'd rather just watch the fight rather than be involved in it or, you know, have some small involvement. But he likes me in the corner, I think. He like he obviously it has to be like a smooth sailing ship in that corner, and everybody's got their own little job. And believe it or not, that minute is the shortest minute you'll ever see. And the instructions that he gives, they're they're super calm, but they're super informative. Like he knows 
what words he has to use to get the attention of whoever the fighter is in the corner. And I think that's the most important thing. I think a lot of fight, you know, a lot of trainers will be shouting and screaming, or they'll be trying to give so many instructions that actually the fighter can't take. You know, if you think about how long it takes, bell goes. It's probably five seconds by the time they sit down. Five seconds by the time they get up. So you've only really got 45, 50 seconds to deliver exactly what you need. And that's only if it's going smoothly. That's without a cut. That's without, you know, the, the game plan not going right. So 50 seconds really isn't a long time. You know? um, so I've watched him do it now many, many times at every level, whether it be domestic or, or world championship level. And it's quite fascinating to be that close up. And uh, we actually had a fight. Um, Joe Cordina was fighting on the same bill. And he was kind of in like a a fight where he w he was pressing the fight and the guy was getting a bit frustrated and he wasn't really getting out of the fight what he wanted to get out of it. And I think it was after like six or seven rounds, he kind of came back and my dad actually said to him, you know, what, what the fuck are you doing? You know, switch on, make sure you switched on. And that was the first time I, I've really seen my dad kind of have a go at somebody in the corner. So it's quite interesting to watch up close, but... Um, yeah, I don't know how he keeps his cool in that corner, mate, especially at that level when everything's on the line and you've got 45, 50 seconds to deliver it to a fighter instructions. I don't know how he does it. Yeah, I spoke to Joe after and he said, I was coasting the fight and Tony's gone, it's close, it's close. And Joe was thinking, no, it ain't. And then he's like, just giving him a massive bollocking in the corner. But like I said, Tony's so calm and the amount of times I've been to the Matrim gym and he's kind of got like a conveyor belt of fighters. It'll be Ted on the pad, pads um, and then John and then Connor and whatnot. Um, you would have seen the training up close. In terms of just Connor in that gym, I know everyone sort of spurs each other on. They always tell me that. But in terms of Connor, he told me um, in the interview we've done before the fight that he keeps levelling up. He's always, you know, we know he's a gym rat, but have you seen that sort of intensity increase and increase as the years have gone on? I think actually, like, his ambition and his work ethic has probably got him to where he is today. I think it's quite hard being in that gym all the time. It's like, I don't know, it's like us coming in the office every single day of the week and just sitting at our desk for hours at a time. And, and the same kind of drills. I know it's a different it's game plan, but it's always pads, it's always bag, it's the same. Yeah, it's honestly the same, repetitively, militant. It's like the same thing over and over again. But again, when I spoke to my dad after the fight, you know, we had a conversation in the car on the way home. He was explaining to me that, you know, we were talking about his defense and how good his defense is and the way he moves and the way he changes levels and, that's it's so hard to do, not only against a world-level opponent, but to stand in front of them whilst they're firing shots and you're kind of changing levels and, and shimmying and, and then coming back with your own shots. He was explaining to me that is, is, is hours and hours and hours of, of practicing. Um, and that, that came from all of that, that time in the gym when he was injured, when he broke his jaw, when he hurt his hand. He just spent hours and hours, and we've probably seen videos of him doing it. You know, there's there's things on the mirrors where he's constantly just going like this and keeping that head movement flowing. And I think Saturday was the first time really the audience had seen it, but we'd seen it in the gym for a long time that he'd been doing that. And to do it, you know, it's almost like when you watch a footy match and you watch Ronaldo do those kind of step overs against, you know, the best teams in the world. That's kind of what we were watching there. That's super, super hard to do. And that just comes down to, to practice and practice. Even after Tony's trained him, he's still, he's still practicing. Yeah, I mean, we all knew he had that aggression, but obviously, like you said, you've seen it. When I spoke to Nigel after, he said, probably the most satisfying thing is, all right, the knockout, it was sick. We're going to see it through the rounds and it'll probably be up for knockout of the year and whatnot. But the most satisfying thing was the fact that people saw he could box because against Vargas, like you said, you didn't get to see it. Against Granados, when someone's being negative, it almost makes you look bad. So the most satisfying thing was actually the fact that people went, oh, shit, Connor can, Connor can box as well. Yeah, I think, look, you know, credit to our jury. We, you know, we were saying it upstairs earlier. He actually came to fight. And I think Connor had made a big thing about it all week that Granadas kept talking that he was going to come to fight, but actually ran away. And you can't come over here and think that you're going to win a fight if you're just going to run all night. I think he was trying to get that into Algeria to kind of say, don't do what Granado's done subconsciously. I think so. And I think Algeria probably thought the same. I can't come here. If I genuinely believe I'm going to win, I can't come here and run. I've got to engage at some point. And although, you know, it was difficult for him to engage, I just think there was, there was big levels in the night. And um, 
yeah, he just caught him with a peach of a shot. But again, it was all it was all kind of if you watch the replay, it was all those drills of of defence and moving and bobbing and weaving. And as he's kind of bobbed under, the shots come over, and it was just a beautiful shot. In terms of what's next, um, I'm going to ask Connor this in a bit. I know everyone wants to know what's next because he's at that stage now where, I mean, boxing fans are always impatient, but Connor's at that stage where it's like, we just want to see him in again, who's next, whatever, what level is he going to be at? I want to go to something Eddie said. He said there's two levels in between Chris Algieri and world level. So just from your perspective, um, they don't even have to be fights that Connor will have or not have, but just what do you think them two levels are in terms of opponents? Let's just say so you've got Algeria, two levels, and then world level. What are the sort of two levels, would you say? I think Connor could do with one, one more experience learning fight. And that, I think, needs to come from a former world champion, somebody who's been at the top. Everybody's talking about, you know, what's next. I think, obviously, the UGAS fight is probably the most, in terms of the, the division being stacked, I would say that the UGAS fight is probably the best route for him to go. He's already defended his WBA multiple times, but in terms of the champions, for me, he would be the most accessible champion. So right now, he's got a mandatory, so what do we do in the meantime? I think he needs another learning fight, somebody that he can draw the experience out from. Um, there's names being mentioned like Mikey Garcia, Adrian Broner, you know, all of these guys, in terms of what they've accomplished, they're multi-weight, division that's very multi-division world champions you know Chris Algieri was a former world champion at 140 but these guys they're like three four weight world champions and then you start stepping in with the elite depending on who you know the thing is with Broner it really depends depends on what Broner turns up because if we get a half decent Broner then you're going to be in a really good fight if you just get the waste of time Broner then that's what it is but Garcia I think it's a great fight somebody who's still very fresh he had a bit of an upset last time out, but he's still a, a really, really, you know, elite fighter. But um, I think right now he just Conor Ben just needs experience in the bag. And once he gets those fights under his belt, then he's ready to go. But um, I think I think he's more than capable of winning the world title. And that in that is in 2022 winning this world title. Yeah, again, depending on what happens, I think if we can get... I think also what's important for Conor Ben is he stays active. I think he should be looking at fighting three or four times next year. He's already training. Already, I think he ran on, on the Monday with Tony back at the gym. So he's already said that he wants to stay active. So if we can get him a fight March um, against a big name like Broner or somebody like that and then move on to maybe another big name until... UGAS is ready to fight, then I would see that fight happening probably towards autumn, winter next year. Yeah, just finally, um, in terms of America, I've been out there for, uh, went out there for Andre, where there was decent media coverage, but went out for Devin Haney. And in Vegas, there was tons of US media. We all sort of chat and well, not just about general boxing. And I think, obviously, as a welterweight, you kind of at some point are going to have to go to the US. And I think the Americans seem really interested in Conor Ben, they kept asking me, sort of, how is he perceived in the UK? What's Conor like in person? They're really intrigued by, like, the little clips they see. Um, one of them asked me about him speaking Spanish. Like, there's a lot of intrigue from the States. Do you have to... I know he's fought in the States, but in terms of the big time, is it a good idea to introduce him to the States beforehand instead of just going, right, here's your world title fight, go and fight at the MGM Grand? I think, like, you know, if the right fight comes up, the problem is now it all becomes a bit like politics because... He's such a big name in the UK, and really, apart from like Joshua and um, and Dillian White, he's kind of our big name here for the zone. So, I think it would be really tough to go and put him on another undercard out in America. And also, you have to start looking at like how much money he's earning. There won't be many undercards you can go on that will generate the amount of money for him to go on and just be a co co main or chief support. So. Really and truly, I think the fighters are here for him now, unless there's a mega blockbuster fight where he has to go over there. I, I don't think he has any issues with going over there either. I think, you know, we was talking about the Broner fight, and he said, well, you know, if Broner can't come here, I'll just go over there. But I think it's more, um, it's more, it's, it's more from the business side how it's going to work. Um, but, you know, we were over there in, um, I think it was like in the summer when, Martin Ward was fighting on the Devin Haney Lenares card uh, in Vegas, and 
we were kind of hopping around the gyms and everybody was following him. Everybody was asking him questions. Every media outlet wanted to talk to him. So they're super keen on on watching him fight. Um, we was told actually on the weekend that there was a huge American um, viewed, viewing figures coming from America, which is great. So you know, a lot of a lot of press today want to talk to him um, from America, and this is going to be the first real time that we've had that kind of crossover where the U.S. Um, media wants to talk to him. So it's definitely evolving, and, and they're very interested. Um, but right now, he's our he's our man carrying carrying the UK flag. So I don't I don't see him fighting over there unless one, it's a world title fight, and we have to go over there, or two the fight makes financial sense for matching the zone. Right, go. 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 Go.